All right, let's wrap up Law of Sines with a little recap, and then we'll take a look at a couple of examples for Law of Sines. So when we had left off, we were talking a little bit about the ambiguous case. And we had done a couple of examples. Sometimes we would get one triangle. Sometimes we get two triangles, sometimes none. So if you remember, when we got a sine value that was greater than one, that made no triangle. If we got a sine value that was positive, it, in this case, it only produced one triangle because the 180 minus that angle when you added it to the already given angle is more than 180. And then the other case where it gave us two triangles because they both work. So sort of a recap, and this is in the PowerPoint notes, how do you figure out the ambiguous case? Well, the first thing is draw yourself a picture. Solve for one of the missing angles. It'll be obvious which one, it'll be the only one that you have an opposite side for, but not the angle. Right? If you get a domain error, then there's no triangle. And domain error is another way of saying like sine of the angle equals more than one or less than negative one. So there's no triangle. Calculate 180 minus the angle and then see if you can add that to the angle that you already have and figure out whether it's more or less than 180. So if you like sort of a flow chart, here's a flow chart. If your number is less than 180, you've got two triangles. Otherwise, you only have one. That's the one we saw before. And then solve for the remaining sides. So sometimes you will get two sets of sides and angles depending on whether you have one triangle or two triangles. So here's a triangle, X, Y, Z. I give you an angle, I give you two sides, find all possible triangles determined by these values. So if you want, you can actually pause the video here, try this problem on your own, and then come back and I'll solve the problem out. And you can see how you did. So if you wanna pause this now, otherwise I'm gonna run right into the answer. All right, so if you had a chance to try this problem, let's see what we get. Triangle X, Y, Z. So doesn't matter which one is X, Y, or Z, as long as we're consistent with the sides. So the measure of angle X is 40. The side X is 14. Side Z is 21. Find all possible triangles. So the first thing we'll do is we have the sine of 40. And the side opposite that angle is 14. What else do we have? We have angle Z and the side opposite. So we don't know what Z is. So we'll call it the sine of angle Z. And then the opposite side is 21. All right, so I get 14 times the sine of Z equals 21 times the sine of 40. Divide both sides by 14. And the sine of angle Z, let's see what we get. I get 0.9642. And so the measure of angle Z must be the inverse sine of 0.9642. Check to make sure my calculator is in degree mode. And I get 74.62. All right, so here we had a positive sine value, which means that it could be in quadrant one or it could be in quadrant two. So clearly 74.62 is in quadrant number one. What's the other value in quadrant number two? So option number two is to do 180 minus 74.62 and see if we get an angle measure that makes sense. So 180 minus 74.62 gives me 105.38. Now, is that reasonable? Well, the angle that was given was 40 degrees. So if I take 105.38 and add it to 40 degrees, I get an angle measure that's less than 180. So that means that both of those triangles exist. Right, so let's take a look at each of those triangles and find missing sides and missing angles. All right, so triangle number one. The measure of angle Z is 74.3. 6, 2, and then the measure of angle Y is 180 minus 74.62 minus the 40 that was already given. So when I do that, 180 minus 74.62 minus 40 gives me 65.38. All right, so now I've got two angles. Angle X was already given to me, that's 40. 
I've got two of the sides. The only side that I don't have is at side y. Well, let's set up a law of sines. Sine of 40 over 14 equals the sine of y, which is 65.38 over y. All right, let's multiply 14 times the sine of 65.38 and now divide it by the sine of 40. So I'm just going to type it into my calculator as the sine of 40, and I get 19.8. Yeah, actually, 19.80. Right, so that's triangle number one. Angle Z measure, angle Y measure, side Y. All right, for triangle two, now we get to use the other option here. So the measure of angle Z is 105.38 which means the measure of angle Y is 180 minus 105.38 minus the 40 that was given. All right, so let's do that. Let's do 180 minus 105.38 minus 40, and that gives me 34.62. So that's the other option for the measure of angle Y. That's what happens if it's an acute, if it's a, well, they're both acute angles, but smaller angle. And then we set up our law of signs. So let's go back to the 40 and the 14 because I know I can't have messed that up, right? It's possible that I messed up one of the other angle measures, but not the 40 and the 14 because that was given. So that's why I usually try to go back as often as I can to the given information. So sine of 40 over 14 equals the sine of angle Y. Well, angle Y in this case is 34.62. So the sine of Y over Y. So cross multiply, get my calculator to do a little work here. I'll do 14 times the sine of 34.62. Take that number and divide it by the sine of 40. And I get 12.37. If I was given units, these would be whatever linear units I had, inches, feet, so forth. But I don't, so there it is. All right, so I've solved both triangles. For both triangles, I've got the measure of angle Z, the measure of angle Y, and the length of side Y, and those were the three things I was missing from the given info. All right, so let's take a look at two application problems. This says... A surveyor needs to determine the distance between two points that lie on opposite sides of a river. The picture shows 300 yards are measured along one bank. The angles from each of the line segments are 62 and 53. Find the distance between A and B to the nearest tenth of a yard. So he can figure out how far it is from point A to point C. Right? Here's point A, there's point C, so they've already measured 300 yards. He knows the angle, so he could put a stake in the ground on the other side of the river, and he can measure that from angle A, it's 62 degrees from that stake. Then he can walk over to point C and say, all right, well, it's 53 degrees from there. But he wants to know how far it is from A to B. That's his missing side, which, I mean, we could be consistent with the labels and just call it side C. How does he figure that out? It would be hard to take a tape measure across the river, so the law of signs will help us to find that missing side. So I know that I want the side C. So I've got the sine of 53 over C, right? So the sine of angle C over side C. But now I need a pair of angles and opposite sides, and I don't have that. I have 300 yards for essentially the length of B, but I don't have an angle at B but I can get one because I know one of them is 62, the other is 53. If they all add up to 180, subtract them. So do 180 minus 53 minus 62, and I get 65 degrees for this angle here. So it is possible if you have two of the angles to find the third one simply by subtracting from 180. And now I've got opposite sides and angles, and that's what I want. So up on the top here goes the sine of 65. What's opposite the 65? The 300. All right, and then we cross multiply. 300 times the sine of 53 degrees equals C times the sine of 65. And remember that the sine of 65 is just a number. So divide both sides by the sine of 65. 
careful how you enter in your calculator. Some calculators will pop open a set of parentheses when you hit the sign. If you don't close the parentheses, it's going to stick the denominator inside that sign. You'll have a sign inside another sign. So here, let's try it out. You try it, and I'll try it. Make sure your calculator is in degree mode. 300 times the sine of 53. Hit enter to get an answer, and then do divided by the sine of 65. I get 264.35. But it said to the nearest tenth. So to the nearest tenth is 264.4 yards. And now he can measure from one side of the river without having to wade into the river with a tape measure and measure across. Okay, so that's one application of it. Here's another one. It says from where you stand, you look up to the top of a small hill. And we had actually done this problem when we did right triangle trig at the beginning of the course, which depending when you're taking this might not have been all that far away. But we had done this with right triangle trig in two triangles, and it got a little bit messy setting up the algebra. So maybe the law of sines will actually help me to solve this more efficiently. So I look up at the top of a small hill with an angle of elevation 25 degrees. I walk 100 feet closer. It's now 40 degrees. Use the law of sines to help you find the height of the hill. So let's draw ourselves a picture first. So from where I stand, I look up to the top of the hill. Let's use H for hill. Angle of elevation is 25 degrees. I move 100 feet closer. And the angle of elevation is now 40 degrees. Use the law of science to help you find the height of the hill. How do we do this? Well, the first thing is we need a variable to represent that distance that's in between here. So, I don't know, let's call it P for missing piece. And now I can fill in a couple of other angle measures. If this thing down here is 40, then this thing over here is 140 because I have to add up to 180. And now add the 140 plus 25, I get 165. Subtracted from 180, I get 15. So 15 degrees is that little angle up there. So how does my law of sines look? It says... The sine of 15 over 100, right? That's the angle measure up at the top. The sine of 15 over 100 equals the sine of 25 over that missing piece. With that information, I'm essentially finding the hypotenuse of that triangle that's on the left. So let's give it a shot. Let's do 100 sine 25 and divide it by the sine of 15 to get that missing piece. All right, let's see what we get. All right, I get 163.29. All right, so how does the law of sines help me to solve this? I mean, I didn't solve for the height. I solved for that missing piece. Well, I solved for the hypotenuse of a right triangle. And now I can actually solve the whole rest of the problem with right triangle trig. That's the height of the hill I'm looking for. That's a 40 degree angle. This is 163.29 in units. And so now, based on this 40-degree angle, I want the opposite side. I have the hypotenuse. That's sine. So the sine of 40 equals opposite over hypotenuse. Multiply both sides by 163.29, or think of it as cross-multiplying by putting this over 1. And so you'll get 163.29. Sine 40 equals h. And now I can do that in one step in my calculator. 163.29 times the sine of 40. I get 104.96. Okay. So if you remember the way we did it when we did it with the two right triangles was we looked at the little right triangle over here, and then we looked at the whole big thing as a triangle. And we found common pieces and cross multiplied and set them equal to each other and then substituted one into the other because essentially we had created a system of equations. 
did that, and we're able to find the answer. This is a more efficient way of doing it. To use the law of sines to find that missing side from when you walked 100 feet closer. And then you notice that I could actually, I could find the distance that you were standing from the base of the mountain, but I don't need it because I've already found that height of that mountain, or the hill in this case, by using a combination of law of sines and right triangle trig.